first I want to introduce everyone. So Tim, if you want to wave. Or he's moving back. Yeah, there you go. You can see him. Uh, Drew, well, Drew, we can't sir currently see Drew, but Drew is here. Drew, do you okay. want to say hi? Yeah. Yeah. And then my name is Monica Jean. I'm a field crops educator for Michigan State University Extension, and I'm stationed in the central Michigan area. And we have Julie Dahl and Liz, both who work at the Kellogg Biological um, long-term ecological research program. I really quick want to thank, we have got lots of sponsors for this. Um, so I just want to thank Chunk, Chuck Lipstrew, Adam Reamer, and Tom Zimnicki, and also the Herb Family Foundation and the National Science Foundation. Here quick, I'm just going to show you for the relay cropping practice field we're about to talk about. The wheat planting um, happened October 13th. Um, nitrogen was put on herbicide. You can see all of his agronomic practices here on the screen. So uh, take a quick mental shot of this. Uh, and this will be, of course, on the screen for you to review once this video is over with if you want to see um, what Tim's been using uh, for his practices in the field. And with that, let's transition over to the video. Tim, it's your turn. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're trying something new here. We'll see how it goes. Certainly with, with everything we've got going on with uh, gatherings and such, it, it changes the way perhaps that we, we do some of these field days. But I'm excited to, to try something new here like this today that certainly there's always a lot of benefit to getting out on a farm and kind of kicking the tires, seeing what you got going on. But uh, there's geographic proximity that's, that's certainly a constraint on those sorts of things. So by doing this virtually, we're going to be able to have a much broader audience, and we should be able to come back to this and, and view it later, uh, future reference. So we'll try something new. Um, Monica did an introduction there. I believe I can't hear Monica, so we're working through our technology pieces here. Uh, really appreciate Monica coming down with MSU Extension. Julie Dell is on the other side of the camera with MSU LTER this morning. So we're going to kind of work our way through this and see how things go. So. We'll start off with the, the, the relay cropping here, and this is probably where I'm gonna spend the most time of, of talking through what I've been doing and what's been working and what hasn't. I always find that, that the best way for me to improve practices on my farm is to, is to show and share what's going on, and I inevitably get a lot of helpful feedback coming back in, ideas to do different things. So it's not always the most easy thing or, or natural thing for me to stand up and you know, go on a video and talk in depth about what we're doing but it always comes back to benefit. So this is maybe the fifth or sixth year we've been doing relay cropping. And the last couple of years have started going a lot better. I think we've gotten a lot of the kinks ironed out of the system. There's certainly been, been hiccups that we've, we've learned along the way. I've got a number of different things that I'd like to keep kind of increasing and, and doing better at the system. But here we are today. Uh, beans look pretty good. Um, Monica put up the the information there about what we've been doing in the field. So wheat came off maybe two weeks ago, something like that. And you can see that um, we've got some decent regrowth in the beans. We've been really dry, uh, certainly probably not as dry as we've been the last couple of years. And it, if anything, I've been talking to some folks that based on our rainfall amounts, uh, what the drought monitor certainly looks like, if, if that keeps getting worse, I don't think we're as dry as we've been the last few years. So maybe that's our soils doing a little bit better, responding to some of the resiliency practices we've been trying to implement. Probably some of that is getting weed into these rotations, getting some diversity here. So I'll walk through a few different things. Um, a couple lessons I've learned that I think have been a big piece of, of why this has been working better. We've been planting the beans as early as possible every season. And when I first started off doing this, it was kind of an experiment. We'll play around with the relay cropping. Uh, we had been putting all the, our weed into these twin rows, mainly because I didn't want to own a drill, the limited amount of wheat that we really do. But we'd get all the main crops in and then we'd come back and start playing around with relay cropping. So that's inevitably mid-June, something like that. And the wheat's flowering quite often. It's, it's waist high. Uh, our problem ended up becoming for so many ways of we ran out of soil moisture. And we're in a lot of sandy loam soils here. We don't have fantastic water holding capacity. It seems our weather patterns have become a little bit more variable. So uh, the last few years, we start getting dry in, in June rather than that traditional flash drought period for us of July, August. 
So when we're planting soybeans in these really dry conditions, uh, the wheat's taking up a ton of water during, during grain fill. I'm always surprised at how much water wheat's extracting out of that soil profile when it's, when it's trying to complete the back half of its, its life, life cycle there. Once we moved to a system of trying to get beans planted a lot earlier into the season, we got better establishment. They got a little bit more growth on them before that wheat would tend to come up and, and canopy the row. It ended up working a lot better. Uh, everybody asks about how you time the passes in these sorts of operations. With the wide row wheat we're using, we're, we're, we do need to do a herbicide application. And we've had pretty good luck with Affinity Broad Spec, really a green up for the wheat. For the wheat. The plant back rotation for beans is only two weeks on that. And I've had some luck even crowding that a bit. Uh, we're not doing any uh, fall herbicide applications. When I've had it, when I've when I've tried to cut back on that that the intensity of that herbicide regimen like using generic Harmony, for instance, something like that, we will end up getting some weed escapes. And and last year we had some trouble with mare's tail escaping. In the past, that I've looked to just put the cheapest soybean into the ground here as possible, with uh, the understanding that it, it's kind of a risky situation. We've had years where we just didn't get any soybean yield, and. And so I hate to throw a lot of extra money out there into this field if we don't really have to. That said, this year we're all Liberty Beans. We've been able to come back up and clean up some mare's tail escape an awful lot better. So we're looking here probably today, uh, 25 bushel beans maybe. And that is dependent a lot on, on what we have for, for August rains. As I've said, we've ranged from zero to 25, 30. These beans probably look a little bit better than we've had in the past. Um, a few things as, as we can kind of walk through of, of what the harvest operation looks like, what we're trying to do here. You can see that our, our, our straw length is not terribly short and we're still running a, a flat head here and I can walk through of, of exactly how we're thing and, and what that procedure looks like. So a little bit of this for us too is, is trying to limit how much money we're investing into the system here. Uh, we're running every year about uh, 50 to 80 acres of wheat. So I mean, we're not a large farm. We're far 500 acres in the first place. And so the capital budget available for equipment upgrades and, and pouring money into the system is a little constrained when you're just not covering that many acres. I've, I'm running a, a 9,500 combine, 20 foot head, and I haven't done an awful lot of extra modifications to this. A row crop head is, is definitely the way to go. There's a lot of advantages to that of you don't damage the soybeans quite so much. You get to clip that, that wheat straw a little, a little lower, get it moved out of the, the, the system. Uh, but I mean, those, those heads aren't cheap and they take some work to maintain. So I'll stress with this whole system too, that the barriers to entry into this aren't mechanical and they, they're not equipment. And I mean, my head goes there a lot of times and I know a lot of the people I talk to too, have questions about how we're going to make this work and, and how do I make how do I leave a gap for the soybeans and what do I plant the soybeans with? They're fun questions to kind of work through. There definitely is some equipment modification necessary to do some of those things, but the limitation with the system is more about the fact of, is your attitude that you get to combine the field twice or that you have to combine the field twice? It's a mental thing and it's, it's how you're going to approach doing extra work within the system that tends to be the limitation. So, there's some pretty easy modifications to, to get yourself into the system. Um, I've, I've worked and talked to some guys that are just uh, bolting some poly onto the cutter bar. Putting six inch drain tile onto the cutter bar works pretty well. We're running these flexi finger kind of crop lifter pans. They work pretty well. They're not the cheapest, uh, but a couple of years ago when the beans were getting quite a bit taller um, due to the fact we were planting them much earlier. Uh, I was running out of time and I needed something that I figured was gonna work. And so we picked these up, they work pretty well. They're probably a little too narrow for the system we're running, but that's a simple modification of, of bolting a, a bigger pan onto the bottom or doing something like that. So the biggest lesson with doing these relay crop beans really is the fact that you don't wanna be damaging the soybeans. And as they do get taller, there's certainly a risk of, of doing that. When you clip off this, this apical meristem, and that's what we've done here in a few of these trifoliates, the, the growing point there is intact. But every time you're, you're damaging these soybeans, we really see that we stunt them back. 
And, and that's the biggest thing to avoid. It's probably the biggest advantage of that row crop head is you're just gonna be a lot more uh, protective of, of the soybean here. So the combine tires and the spacings are always an issue too. Um, we have 30.5 tires on this combine and I haven't made any modifications to those. If we're gonna bring a row crop head, we are gonna to have to, to do something with the tires and space them out. With the platform here, I just move over 15 inches. So we're running 30.5 tires, 30 inch rows. And the wheat is planted with RTK, but the soybeans are planted just by hand uh, or with, with manual steering. So it's certainly an issue of sneaking the combine down between those rows. It, it, it helps a bit from the fact that when you're planting these soybeans into the system, they stretch for light quite a bit in the early in their life cycle. So this bean doesn't show it perhaps as much as some, but, but a lot of times that, that is pretty high. And, and so being possible about getting bent over out of the combine row. I'm standing in a row here right now down. So you can see as we look down the row, there's certainly some areas where you kind of kind of ding the beans up a little bit. But by and large, maybe a week after soybean harvest or uh, wheat harvest, you can't see where the combines have gone. As my mic flips down. So it's a system that we keep working on improving. The biggest thing for me probably is, is getting a row crop head uh, that's in the barn, that's in pieces running and, and, and kind of moving ahead for next year. But the biggest takeaways for me, if you're going to get into the system, um, and it's easy to do, uh, you block off some rows of the drill. You don't have to have a twin row planter necessarily for how we're doing it. Uh, take a couple acres and just play around with it. Uh, watch how that wheat morphology changes a little bit. The, the wheat architecture through the season does look different when it's, when it's in narrow rows like this. I have questions on some of the things we're doing of planting rates for both the wheat and of the soybeans to some extent. My philosophy with this, and, and we started off growing white wheat within the system and have moved to red as the premiums have moved away. I was really striving for, for max wheat yield and we'll take whatever we can get off the beans at the back end. And we're tending to see a 10 or 15% reduction in the wheat yields and that seems to be pretty consistent between years. But anymore, I think it's, it's the better system is a better balance between the wheat and the soybeans. Maybe backing off that wheat population, not trying to push the wheat quite so hard, and if we can get a more consistent uh, soybean crop at the back end, if we can go from a 20 to 25 bushel average to a 35, 40, something like that, that's probably going to make more sense than, than just pushing this wheat as hard as we can and taking whatever we can get on the back end. <music>